solution. The miners in Lancashire are to be instructed to join the strike, despite the fact that they voted by almost six to four against a strike. Local union representatives today decided to call them out from Monday, but also to press for a national ballot. The coal board described the strike call as an abdication of democracy. In Nottinghamshire, there were more heavy picketings today, but the coal board said that across the country, three more pits than yesterday were at work. The Lancashire delegates faced a dilemma, only one pit working and an increasing reluctance to cross picket lines. They feared their men would soon start to turn on each other. So despite last week's vote rejecting a strike, they called everyone out for a week from Monday. We've reached a situation where we as an area had to do something to bring our members together. But you're saying that you think your men voted the wrong way and now you, their delegates, are going to take the decision back out no, of their hands. I've never said our men voted the wrong way. When you have a democratic ballot, it's up to the uh, individual member. What we've done this morning, uh, we hope to get a national ballot and then that will regularise the position right across the country. But at the one pit left working, confusion still reigns. A mass meeting voted to continue production. But the pickets were promised the pit would be closed. What will happen on Monday, no one seems certain. And if there's no national ballot, what happens then? No one tonight seemed able to say. In Nottinghamshire, the working miner still braves the pickets' abuse. Each shift discusses the uncomfortable pressure. Some men, converted by the pickets, earn their cheers. But production is continuing, say the coal board, despite the growing picket numbers. At some pits, the police have introduced new control techniques, isolating the colliery area so that pickets cannot reach miners clocking on. A police roadblock half a mile away stops and inspects all vehicles, and all potential pickets are turned back. There have been a number of arrests, two when police used a crowbar on the windscreen of a picket's car. But the coalfields strike policy remains ambiguous. They have a mandate by virtue of a majority of about 20,000 that they want to go to work. That is their fundamental right and equally it is a fundamental right to respect pick picket lines. The flying pickets don't recognise the Nottinghamshire miners' dilemma and they threaten an even heavier picketing effort at selected pits on the coalfield overnight. Britain's open cast miners have thrown their weight behind the NUM. The mines produce about a tenth of the NCB's total output and they're highly profitable. The coal's dug by private firms contracted to the coal board. That's why the workers are in the Transport and General Workers Union. Today, after hearing an appeal from the NUM, they voted not to release any of their coal. Well, their fight is our fight. They are fighting for jobs and they're also fighting to prevent imports of energy. Our people in open cast are also being made redundant. Uh, they're determined to support the miners in the fight for jobs. It's the biggest boost the NUM's had from other unions. Some train drivers have refused to cross picket lines and seamen have blocked some coal imports. But the main unions in the power stations have advised their members to ignore NUM pickets. The miners anyway have turned most of their energy against each other and so far there's been no pressure on industry or the government. The miners' president, Arthur Scargill, said today that the strike is widening. He says 85% of collieries have now stopped work. But Mr Scargill said there was naked intervention by the government in the dispute. The police were operating as a paramilitary force. And he said the government seemed determined to smash not only the miners, but every trade union. The Home Office Minister Douglas Hurd said officers drafted into the Nottinghamshire area had been issued with equipment including riot shields under what he called standard arrangements. County councillors from Nottinghamshire met ministers to try to get help with the extra cost of policing. They estimate £3 million has been spent so far and that will rise to £5 million by the end of the month. By the left, quick march! The huge cost of the police operation, of which Nottingham must bear half, has been a shock at the end of the financial year. Already facing a penalty for overspending generally, the delegation was asking that their share of the police bill is given special treatment and not included in their normal budget. The government have so far accepted that in the exceptional circumstances that Nottingham is facing, it would probably be wrong for us to have to pay penalties but the government haven't yet made up its mind whether they will exempt us from penalties on the whole of the money or only a part of it. 
Having got this concession, the councillors went on to the Home Office to seek an exceptional cash grant, but this time they were told no. Their police authority meets tomorrow when they must decide if they can afford their share of all the extra officers given the government's decisions. A man from Belfast has appeared in court in London in connection with the Harrods bombing. Paul Kavanagh faces six charges, including one of conspiracy with others to cause explosions between October last year and January. The car bomb explosion outside Harrods just before Christmas killed six people and injured nearly a hundred. Kavanagh was arrested in Belfast and flown to London at the weekend. Kate Adie was in court. The area around Lambeth Magistrates Court was bristling with lookouts and armed police as the Belfast man held at Paddington Green Police Station for the last five days was brought in. Paul Kavanagh, who's 28 and unemployed, was arrested last Friday in a joint operation between Scotland Yard and the Royal Ulster Constabulary. This morning he faced six charges. One charge is that he conspired with others between October last year and January this year to cause explosions. This covers a period during which four bombs went off in London. One of them, the car bomb outside Harrods, which killed six people and injured 94. Kavanagh was in court for a quarter of an hour, a short, stocky man with brown hair. In court with him was another Belfast man, Thomas Quigley, who's already facing charges involving murder, attempted murder, and causing explosions. They're both jointly charged that they were involved three years ago in five bomb attacks in London. This was the IRA bombing campaign in the autumn of 1981, in which two people were killed in an explosion at Chelsea Barracks. Sir Stuart Pringle, Commandant General of the Royal Marines, was attacked. Bomb disposal expert Kenneth Howarth died while dealing with a bomb in a wimpy bar in Oxford Street. A bomb was defused in Debenham's department store, also in Oxford Street, and the home of the Attorney General, Sir Michael Havers, was damaged by a bomb. Explosives discovered in Annesley Forest in Nottinghamshire also figure in charges against Kavanagh, along with a find of several firearms. Kavanagh and Quigley said nothing during their court appearance, and both were remanded in custody until next Thursday. Two university students have appeared in court in Belfast in connection with the murder of the Mays Prison Assistant Governor, Bill McConnell. James McAleenan, a 24-year-old political science graduate, was charged with the murder, and Sean Hayes, a computer science student, was charged with possessing firearms with intent and withholding information. Both deny the allegations. Mr McConnell was shot dead on the doorstep of his home in East Belfast earlier this month, and eight people have now been charged in connection with his murder.